So as the children are leaving for uh, walkout worship, I um, just want to encourage you, give you some words of encouragement. We're going to open up scripture and we're going to hear from God's word and that's going to be especially difficult for us today because it smells like turkey in here. <laughs> I've been smelling that since 7 o'clock this morning. I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> No. As we open up uh, God's Word this morning, we are continuing, actually ending today, uh, a sermon series that we've been in for the past couple of months, talking about our vision and our mission here at Hopkins Community Reformed Church. We started off by talking about our vision statement, which is to know Christ and to make Christ known. It is the overarching uh, vision of the church that we, we feel God has called us to, that we are in all things to be about always knowing Christ more, growing in our relationship with him, and making him known that we are living that out in our daily lives and in the mission of the church. And then we started talking about our mission principles. Our mission principles are that we are a church that helps people connect. We are a church that helps people to grow and that we are a church that, that goes, that actually goes out and does ministry. And we started with Connect, which was, which means like we want to be a church where anybody that walks through our doors experiences what we consider to be authentic Christian fellowship, that this can be a community of faith where they can connect with other people of faith, but more importantly, that through all that we do here, we can be a place that helps people to connect in the relationship with God, whether they are already in that relationship or whether they are unbelievers and seeking that out. We also want to be a place where, where uh, people can grow, where when, when people come to this church and when, when there are uh, meetings or Sunday school or worship or whatever, that we are always growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ, that we are deepening that relationship with Christ, and that we can be equipped and transformed and mobilized to then go, to be on mission with God in the world. And that's where we have been for the past couple of weeks covering the, the mission principle, go. And we have used Acts 1 verse 8 as our kind of guide for this. Acts 1 verse 8 reads, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we looked at this as, as a sort of uh, concentric circles that move ever outward and with, with Christ at our center. And, and that talks about our mission, that our mission, maybe it begins here. Our mission begins in our relationship with Jesus Christ, but it kind of spreads out in ever widening spheres of influence in our lives. That we're always moving outwards. We're not just keeping it to ourselves. And we looked at that in, in this Acts passage as, you know, being Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We talked about Jerusalem. Jerusalem being like our families and our, our workplace relationships. All of those relationships that are, are closest to us, the people that we spend the most amount of time with. Then we talked about the, the Judea and Samaria, which we kind of interpreted for ourselves as being our community. Last week we asked the question, do we see the Hopkins community as Christ sees the Hopkins community. Christ in, this, in the passage, the Matthew 9 passage, saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And we, we asked that question, do, do we see our own community that way? And do we have compassion on them? Or do we, do we see everybody as being, you know, pretty okay and being pretty, pretty good? And, and it really is a question about who we see as our Savior? Do we see the community, the government, the social programs as being that which saves us? Or do we claim a hope of something deeper, something greater, something bigger in Jesus Christ? So today we're going to talk about that final one, to the ends of the earth. We're going to be Christ's witnesses in our, in our families and in, in our Jerusalems and then in Judea and Samaria, our communities. And then it says, to the ends of the earth. And we're going to talk about what that means, especially looking at Matthew 28. So I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew 28. If you uh, don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. The words will also be on the screen. Matthew 28. So what has happened to this point is that Jesus has been raised from the dead. 
He has met with a couple of people. He's been seen by, by many. And now he's about to go into heaven. He's about to ascend into heaven. And the disciples and his followers gather on a mountain where he, he told them to gather. And he meets them there. And then he says these words from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Listen for the word of the Lord this morning. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God. So Jesus shows up, which is in and of itself a miracle because he was dead. And now he is alive. And he shows up to his followers on the mountain. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. And, and for, that, for us, that kind of it makes sense, right? We, we have this knowledge of the universe that's expansive. And, and we believe that God is Lord of all. He holds the heavens and the earth in his hands. But when Jesus was saying this, when he was speaking this to his followers here, their knowledge of what the universe was was actually quite a bit different. The earth... The gene is the Greek word for it. Is, is kind of a, a Greek, uh, it's, a, it's a Greek word, it, it's a Greek understanding of, of a realm in which humans live. The earth, the land, the, the place where creation is, is different than the place where God is. That God is over and above all things. That he, he's living in uh, what Genesis calls the firmament, the, the sky, everything above the clouds. When you, if you could see past the blue, that's where God lives. But Jesus says this, all authority in heaven in the place where God lives, in, in the very seat where God dwells, the place from which creation came, the, the place where creation is ordered and sustained, all that authority, and all the authority in this little place where you all live too, what we call earth, has been given to me. Now, when Jesus was in his ministry, he demonstrated authority over all these things on the earth, right? He demonstrated authority over creation. He calmed the seas. He calmed the waves. He demonstrated authority over disease and, and, and things of that nature. He healed many diseases. He showed authority over religion. Challenging the religious leaders and their, their so-called laws. He demonstrated authority over government, not to, to overthrow it, but to say, your government is God-ordained. All authority is given by God. And he demonstrated authority over death itself. Not only by raising by, by being raised from the dead, but by raising another from the dead as well, when he raised Lazarus. So it's not that Jesus is suddenly gaining an authority that he didn't have before. It's just that maybe the sphere of influence, the sphere in which he exercises that authority, has now expanded to include absolutely everything. And this authority has been given to him by the Father. We see God maybe as being uh, the overall authority of everything, but his power now is mediated through the Son because all authority has been given to Jesus. And what we get here is two features that flow out of this authority statement. Because Jesus now has the authority, therefore the disciples are to go and make disciples. This phrase that I read, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to explain it real quick because it's got a lot of really big words. Seminary words. <sighs> Seminary words. We'll just go with that. Jesus' promotion to universal authority serves as an eschatological marker inaugurating the beginning of this universal mission. 
Okay? Lots of seminary, seminary words in here. Jesus has been given all authority, and because he's been given all authority, because he has been raised from the dead, because he is seated at the right hand of God, he has sent his disciples, all those who follow him, to be out on mission with him to usher in what we think of as the end times. Now, I'm not talking about trying to get God to come back and, and, and do things like that, but that part of God's mission is to bring the love and grace of Jesus Christ to everyone in the world. That everyone would know the grace and the love of God. And this vision that we get in Revelation that we could all be in relationship with God again. That we could return to Eden and dwell with God. That's the vision that all things are restored and made right again. That we were all reconciled to God. And Jesus, given authority and then sending authority ushers in this mission that we are to be on, to be on mission with God to, to bring this about in the world. Now, not only does he do that, but he gives them this assurance, this second feature. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go, and I'm going to be with you always. Not only do I have all authority, but I am going to take that authority, and I'm going to go with you. You do not have to be afraid because I am going to go with you. It's this continuing trajectory that God has, has had since the very beginning. In Genesis, we see this idea of the, the, the command to, to humans, to Adam and Eve, what? Go and fill the earth and subdue it. Then we get this next command, go Make disciples. Be my witnesses. Or perhaps maybe a, a better way to look at it is, is the way that, that God has been moving, and we see this throughout the whole of Scripture, that, that in Genesis we are created and given the image of God, and we are to be image bearers of God. And then in Genesis 12, God claims a people and says, you're going to be my people. You're going to be a light to the nations. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And in the fulfillment of that, Jesus comes, he lives, he dies, he rises from the dead, he says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, go and make disciples. The third thing, you will be my witnesses until the day when he comes back to say, you are mine. Come you who are blessed by my Father and share in this inheritance. This is God's work. This is what God has been about since the very beginning, to bring people into relationship with him, to share his love and his grace. Only God can create. Only God gives identity. Only God has the authority to send out in God's name. And only God can do the full work of restoration. And what does God say? I have this authority. Now go. I'm giving that to you. I'm sending you out in my name. Now, when we look at this passage, I love this. This is, this is like the coolest thing. Uh, when we look at this passage, we, we often see the, the go as being the word, right? That is the word. So all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, go. And you're like, go? Go where? What? Where, where should I go? When should I go? How, how should I go? But if, if you look at the actual Greek words, the imperative, the command, the, the, the thrust of that statement is not actually in the go. It's in the make disciples. That we are called, because of all the authority that God has been given in Jesus Christ, or that God has given Jesus Christ, we are called to make disciples. And the other parts, the, the baptizing, the, the teaching, and the going are all linked. They're called participles. They're all linked to the command. So, therefore, make disciples. Baptize them. 
teach them, and go and do that wherever you need to go. The implication is that this is happening in in ever-expanding circles, like we've been talking about, that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that it goes out from one place or multiple places to fill the whole earth to the very ends of the earth. And we do this in Jesus' name. Like, like last week when we talked about uh, the, the passage in Matthew 10 where Jesus sends out, or in Matthew, uh, yeah, in Matthew 10 where Jesus sends out his 12 disciples or as we've been looking together as a consistory and some of the ministry teams as uh, Luke, tw- uh, Luke 10 as well where Jesus sends out the 72. The implication is that we are to be on mission with God doing the very same things that he is doing. It's, it's interesting when we, when we think about missions and ministry and stuff like that, we, we get some ideas where it's like, oh yeah, well Jesus says, you know, whatever you did to the least of these, my brothers, uh, you did for me. So, you know, clothe, clothe the people that don't have clothing, give them food, give them drink, uh, provide for them when they're sick, and so on and so on and so on. And then we're like, but we have to go and make disciples, and we're called to do that, and so um, we, we gotta, we, we should be doing this, and, and then we'll do this, or we'll do this, because this is more important, and, and we, we, have to, we have to just provide for everybody, and And the disciple thing, uh, we don't really know how that fits in. But the fact of the matter is, if we look at Jesus' life and his ministry, what did he do? He called 12 disciples who went with him and watched him and, and participated in him healing the sick. Feeding the hungry, visiting the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized people. And then after a while, he sent them out to do the same thing. These missions, this ministry is not, it's not two, two different sides of the same coin. It's actually the same thing. How do we go and make disciples? By doing the things that Jesus did. By following in his footsteps. It's I think sometimes we, we, we try to separate those two. Like we try to separate to know Christ, make Christ known. Like somehow those are two different things. But the call, the call of us, the call of our faith is that we are to be all about living into what Christ did and then living it out all at the same time. That we are growing in our relationship with Christ. And let me tell you, there is no better way to, to grow in your faith than to be ministering to people that have nothing or significantly less than you. That, that somehow you have the audacity to be there to give them the answers. Let me tell you, there is nothing, I, I have never felt more inadequate than, than walking into a room with people who are around their family member who's dying and they look to me as if I'm somehow going to make it all better and make, like, there's no amount of training that, that helps you with that. But what we do is we go to the Word of God We go and look at what Jesus did, the comfort that Jesus offers, the hope that Jesus offers, and together we grow. We grow in Jesus Christ. This has always been the trajectory. It's really fitting, actually, that Matthew's book uh, ends with these words because Matthew, if you read the whole of Matthew, he's always looking forward. He's always looking to that day. That day when everything is going to be fulfilled. When Jesus comes again in his glory and stands on this earth. So he, he ends the book in that way and he, excuse me, he, he just shows once again the trajectory of scripture, the trajectory that God has always been on. This reversal of what happened in Eden where everything was broken, when our relationship with God was severed, when sin entered the world. It's this, this idea that, that what we're doing, what we're about is going to, is going to be a part of, of bringing in, ushering in this kingdom of God when we can all stand before the throne. Even Job, I, I, I like this kind of analogy, you know, we, we do this, we're, we're called to do this and we think, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. You know, this is scary stuff. Like, we're going to go out in Jesus' name and, and we're supposed to somehow help God in his rest- restorative work and his reconciliatory work in the world. And, and 
we're like, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who, who, God better speak because if I'm, if I'm the one that's speaking, good grief, it's going to be, it's going to be rough. But even, even Job in the face of all disaster goes back to the one thing, the one thing that God offers time and time and time and time again. We can go out in the confidence and hope that God is with us and that, as he says, I know my Redeemer lives and in the end, he will stand upon this earth. He will stand upon this earth. That after my skin has been destroyed and and my flesh has failed, I will still see God. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. What an awesome hope. What an awesome strength and encouragement that Jesus says, not only am I sending you out, but I am going with you. And this is all, all pointed towards one thing. One, come back. No. There it is. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, this is all pointed towards this one thing, this vision in Revelation that we get. All of this is pointing towards that great day. In earlier in Revelation, in Revelation 7, there is a, a great multitude that, that John witnesses. He says, I saw a great multitude from every tribe and tongue and nation and people, and they were all standing before the throne. And later on, he also says this. After, after the great battle has happened, after sin and, and Satan and, and everything has been defeated, this great multitude surrounding the throne starts singing and shouting and praising God. Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. This is the trajectory. This is what we're called to bring people into. This is in, in, in making disciples and bringing people together. And bringing people to Christ. This is the trajectory that we have. That we will one day stand before God and s- say the... Oh, that's not supposed to be there. Oh, well. We're supposed to stand... stand. We will be standing before God in the throne room of God with every, every tribe and tongue and nation and people. All those who have accepted Christ as their Savior and singing together, salvation and honor and glory and power belong to our God forever and ever. That's awesome. So what do we do about it? What are we called to do? When we say to go to the ends of the earth, we often think like, okay, foreign missions, right? We, we be witnesses in our families, and then in our community, and then in Africa. Because that's kind of what we think about, right? To end, the ends of the earth for us are Africa, South America, Asia, Australia, you know, Antarctica, I suppose, would be the very end. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that we are called to go out, right? But, and that's not bad, by the way. There are plenty of things that we can do to go out and minister to people in the world. We can support local missions or, or local missionaries that are overseas or that are somewhere else in the world. Uh, just the other week, somebody from the RCA World Missions uh, group stopped in and gave me this little box. He said, you can, you can support giving out audio scripture, uh, like D- MP3 players or whatever, to people. They can hear, uh, hear the word of God in their own language and all you have to do is just put your extra coins in there. It'll pay for one, and like 150 some people will will hear the word of God. That's awesome. You can, I mean, the benevolence fund is a really great idea. This, I, I, I got this the other day. I got my hands on this. It's a Christmas catalog where you can you can use your money to buy goats or chickens or cows or uh, apparently any other farm animal that you can possibly think of, and it will help people to be fed and to have an income source for themselves. But I wonder this morning, as I've been thinking about this, this question was posed to me this week, and you know, God is really good. I was going to talk about, uh, you know, supporting missionaries and, and all this stuff, and, and all this stuff abroad, and that's, that's wonderful stuff. It's all really good. Actually, for our 2016 budget, we're actually budgeting in money to support missionaries that we don't even know yet, so that we can start doing this outward turning of our missions to send and go to the very ends of the earth. But I wonder this morning, I wonder this morning what exactly the ends of the earth means 
for different people. You see, I think that sometimes the ends of the earth can actually be right around the corner. Because some people don't have the means or the money to even get around the corner. Sometimes the ends of the earth might actually be your bedroom door. Because you're suffering with some sort of health issues. That you're suffering with maybe depression or anxiety that keeps you cooped up because you're, you, you just can't go out there. For some people, the ends of the earth looks like bars on a jail cell door. Because you know that you're not going out to see your family this Christmas. I wonder if the ends of the earth looks a little different for us than Africa, Asia, South America. But that the ends of the earth, for some people, might be right here and right now. And so there are other opportunities for us in this holiday season. I think we're going to start doing an angel tree thing where we can actually minister to people in our community who may possibly be facing the decision between providing a gift or a present for their kids or feeding them. Pastor Sarah and I were talking this week. She works with Forgotten Man Ministries and they are working to put uh, together little gift baskets for the inmates. Gifts and, and, and little, little candies and, and treats and stuff that they, don't, they wouldn't normally get, ever. And she was asking about how we could possibly support that. Because, you know, for some people, Gardettos are the bee's knees. Because they haven't, they haven't had some in years. Or a candy bar or something like that. A way that we can bless people whose ends of the earth might only be a few feet in front of them. In the vision we get in Matthew 25 of the last days, the king is sitting on his throne and the people, all the people, are coming before them and they're being separated. Sheep and goats. And we get this, this vision. Those who have followed God, who, who have listened to the call, who have gone out, he says, come you who are blessed by my father. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. What if the ends of the earth aren't just us throwing money at something that's happening abroad, but are us caring intimately even now for those of us in our community. So that together, and this is what I was looking for, together we can stand with our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and our friends around the throne with a great multitude in heaven saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, these are, are very powerful words. They're very strong words. And, and yet they can be confusing, Lord. What should we do in response to this? Who can we go and see? Lord, if, if, if we only knew. But Lord, you know. You know who it is that's struggling. You know who it is that, that needs help that, that we can minister to. Lord, may we be a people that does this. May we be a people that, that seeks out those, the least, the last, and the lost, those who are at their own personal ends of the earth for whatever reason. 
And Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, that you would show us, show us who it is that you are calling us to. And Lord, that you would give us the courage, that you would give us the strength, that you would give us all that we need to minister to those people and respond to your Spirit's call in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you give us these opportunities, that that you have called us to be on mission with you. And so we ask that, that you would send us, that you would show us exactly where you call us to. We ask all of this in your Son's name. Amen.